Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Amanda. I'm with AWS. I'm with Startup Marketing. I'm here all day. If you have any questions, I'm well versed in the loft, what we do here, what's offered here. Happy to answer those questions for you. Uh, I will be with you all afternoon moderating this tech track. Uh, so if you want to know what's upcoming, please let me know. I'd love to introduce to you uh, Will St. Clair. Uh, Will is based in New York. He's a senior solution architect for us, and he's been with AWS for about three years. So everyone give Will a warm welcome. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the technical track here at Startup Day. Uh, I'm Will St. Clair. Um, so the you know, purpose of this talk is to just give you a, a quick overview on you know, some of the security principles you need to keep in mind you know, as you're building a startup, as you're building a product, uh, to you know, make security a priority from day one. Um, you know, it's, even in the you know, short amount of time I've worked for AWS, I've you know, seen the conversation change with customers around security and compliance, particularly as uh, companies develop products that you know, are handling more personally, personally identifiable information, as you know, uh, AWS customers you know, look at using AWS for you know, sensitive workloads, things like healthcare, things like education. And so it's really important to make sure that you have a strategy from day one to you know, you know, secure your data and so that when you, know, you, get, you get traction on your product, when customers start calling and they start asking you questions about security, you can give them the right answers instead of having to go back and re-engineer big parts of your product in order to comply. Uh, so we're just going to talk about a few principles, you know, how they apply to AWS, and uh, you know, tailor that specifically to the uh, startup audience. Uh, so the few principles we want to keep in mind for security by design, um, implement a strong identity foundation. So this means from day one on you know, your startup, you really need to think about you know, what is my system of record for identity for the, you know, not just my employees, but my contractors and freelancers, people who are going to be in, you know, in my systems, you know, working with my data. You know, what are the boundaries for that, and how do I, how do I identify them? Uh, typically, you're going to you know, have something you know, at the very least, say, email. Um, you know, you know, wherever that's hosted, you know, that's usually your first system of record for identity. Um, you can also look at identity as a service providers, but you want something that's going to support identity federation so that you can identify your users in one place, authenticate them with things like multi-factor authentication, and then pivot to other you know, applications in your environment, including your AWS environment. You want to enable traceability. Uh, you want to know, you want to have visibility to what's happening in your AWS environment. You know, this means not only the you know, traceability for your application performance management but traceability for actions that are being performed in your application and your database on your data. You know, who logged into this host? Who accessed this database record? Who you know, pulled up this ticket? Oh, things like that is, are all really important, not only for your operational awareness, but for your um, security awareness, particularly in an incident response situation. Uh, applying security at all layers, you know, not just you know, you know, creating the you know, stereotypical uh, you know, hard outer shell and soft you know, uh, creamy center of uh, you know, security. If you, you know, implement that, it, it doesn't give you a lot of protection when you're dealing with uh, you know, threats inside your own network. Uh, you want to automate security best practices. You don't want to make procedures that are reliant on um, you know, manual operations or individual operations. You know, those are the sort of things that people get fatigued of, op you know, fatigued of, fatigued of maintaining uh, frequently. And you know, if they're not automating, it's, it's unlikely you'll be able to keep up with them. Uh, you need to protect data in transit at rest um, you know, with encryption. You know, not only to you know, uh, you know, protect against the threat of you know, untrusted networks, you know, the overall internet, but also to you know, meet security compliance guidelines for your customers. You know, you know, I guarantee you, you know, down the road, when your customers is going to come knocking, they're going to have a big, list, big checklist that their CISO gave them, or maybe their downstream customer CISO gave them, you know, asking, is data encrypted at rest? Is it data encrypted in transit? How are the keys managed? How are they rotated? You know, that's all stuff that you want to make sure that you're at least thinking about at the beginning. You also want to prepare for security events. Um, you know, when, you, when you've had an incident and uh, you know, you're calling in expensive consultants to help you remediate is really not the time to be putting together an incident response plan. It's going to be very expensive and, and, you know, and uh, painful. So we really want to make sure that um, you're preparing for those. Um, you know, these are all things that we you know, cover as part of the AWS Well-Architected Framework. Uh, the, URL is on this, uh, the URL there is on the screen, but this is uh, um, part of the security pillar. So it, you know, we have a white paper and some more information on you know, some of the places to start looking in your environment. Uh, first, let's talk about implementing a strong identity foundation. Uh, so within AWS, identity is managed through Identity and Access Management, or IAM. Uh, you want to ensure that only authorized or authenticated users are able to access your resources, obviously. 
Um, you know, and this be goes beyond just individual um, users as principals. This can go into service roles as principals, you know, individual machines running on uh, you know, your EC2, EC2 environment as principals. You know, within IAM, you define all of those and you define the you know, credentials and you know, privileges that uh, those principals have. Um, you want to protect AWS credentials. Uh, you know, this is generally where I see you know, customers getting you know, into trouble security-wise is you know, using long-lived static credentials, leaving them on machines, you know, particularly your own developer machines. You know, there's a lot of gross stuff that happens on your workstation. And so if you have a lot of long-lived credentials just sitting on those machines, it's a very common entry point for attackers. Um, and you want to use fine-grained authorization and access control. You don't you know, want to have a bunch of administrator, um, you know, administrator privileges attached to everyone. Um, I'm guilty, as guilty as anyone in, in, of in development environments, you know, blowing open permissions to administrator, you know, credentials to get things working and then dialing it back later. You know, if you do that, make sure you're doing that in development accounts and that those are separated and isolated from your production accounts. Uh, define access. So, um, you know, with users, um, you know, think carefully about who needs access. Um, you know, use uh, some sort of federation scheme to pivot, you know, ac user access from your um, identity system rather than you know, directly creating users in IAM and cutting static keys for them. Uh, if you must cut static keys for users using IAM, you know, make sure that's you know, part of your you know, lifecycle you know, check, you know, checklist for onboarding and offboarding employees, and make sure that those keys are, you know, at the very least, require an MFA to uh, be activated so that I have a key on my machine, I need to call get session token with my MFA in order to get a session credential. Don't have long-lived static keys that have you know, that are uh, active by themselves. Uh, the very, very easy way to get in trouble. Um, and to find a management policy, you know, figure out how, you know, what are the privileges for this user? Um, you know, it's, this is always a fine line. What you wanna err toward is in development environments, you know, that don't have sensitive data, giving people the permissions they need to, you know, try and get stuff done. Whereas in production environments, you wanna lock that down, maybe make that part, you know, maybe tailor the roles that people have much more. Uh, you don't want to you know, have an environment where someone's in a, or have a situation where someone's in a uh, development environment that they can't do anything in and they're locked down and they go rogue where they just, you know, they're frustrated, they can't get anything done. Um, so, you know, partition your environments based on your development and production, and then, you know, give people more privileges in development, fewer privileges in production, you know, aligned with their job role. Um, you know, groups, um, Again, ideally, you can do this in IAM, but I prefer to do it in your identity provider and then map those groups to you know, you know, particular roles or privileges. Uh, services, um, when you're creating policies for um, service principles, you know, these are principles that you might be you know, assigning to things like Lambda functions, you know, principles you might be assigning to things like you know, EC2 instances. When you're doing things like that, you want to you know, make sure that the you know, roles are incredibly granular, that they're only allowing the API you know, calls that you can need, particularly if you can scope it down to visual resources. Um, you know, and that goes along with roles. Um, you know, use roles for instances and functions. Avoid using API keys in code. There's no reason in AWS to ever hard code an uh, AWS API key anywhere. Um, there's you know, not even really a need to put it in something like you know, Secrets Manager or Vault. You want to use the identity instance identity or your ECS task identity or the Lambda function as the root of trust. And from there, you can pivot to the role you need. Uh, protecting AWS credentials. Um, you know, establish less privileged users, particularly in production accounts. Um, you know, in production, you may grant people read only, and then they need to pivot to an additional role that's scoped down in order to perform a certain activity. Um, MFA on the root account is essential when you're creating new AWS accounts. Um, you know, very quickly you might end up with several for development, testing, prod, sandbox. Uh, make sure that when you create new AWS accounts that you're enrolling, uh, enrolling them in M MFA. I prefer to get hard tokens, and you, know, you want to keep those in a safe, you know, have someone sign those in and out so that you have an audit log of who is you know, handling the root credential at that any given time. Um, this says consider federation. I would say you, you pretty much want federation uh, you know, as soon as you can. Uh, set a password policy, again, if you're using IAM users directly. Um, yes? The, so, um, and real quick, because I, I just have to um, keep going here. There's multi-factor authentication at, at two levels. The account has a root credential. When you create a new AWS account, you have a username, password, and you want to assign an MFA token to that. 
that token then becomes the physical root of trust for the account. If you lock yourself out any other way, you can do anything with the root credentials. That's something that's like a one-shot thing when you first set up a new AWS account. You can also assign MFA tokens to individual users so that you know, those users need those tokens to, uh, to um, get, uh, you know, access their own you know, users. Not quite. Let me, let me follow up with you afterward. Yeah. Um, MFA for users in certain operations. Um, oh, it says avoid storing API keys in source control. Do not store API keys in source control. Do not store database passwords in source control. Don't store anything in source control. Um, for things that, you know, for uh, non AWS credentials, things like database passwords, things like third party API keys, uh, we have a new service out called AWS Secrets Manager. Um, this is a great solution because there's no installation or setup. Uh, you just need to uh, configure it in your AWS account. It's going to use your instance profile or your Lambda functions pro, uh, you know, uh, role as sort of the root of trust for accessing, uh, accessing a secret. And uh, it also allows you to define a Lambda function for doing things like rotating that secret automatically. Um, and again, use temporary credentials uh, with STS, particularly if you're pivoting from a long-lived credential. Um, fine grain access control, least privilege, define clear rules for users and roles. Um, use AWS organizations to centrally manage access. AWS organizations is a, a tool that allows you to, you know, organize the individual AWS accounts in your organization, but also, you know, create, uh, you know, centralized policies that allow you to sort of define which services are enabled in each one of those accounts. Uh, and again, for, for more details on some of the, you know, acronyms that's been throwing around, uh, check out our documentation, uh, AWS, um, you know, IAM. STS is the security token service. Um, it's, it's part of IAM, sort of. It uh, is the service that you call directly in order to get individual short-lived tokens from IAM principles. So they're very similar, or they're very related, um, but STS is, uh, has its own uh, API namespace. Uh, and then ABS organizations. <coughs> uh, moving on to detective controls. Um, so a detective control you know, identifies potential security threat um, you know, that is essential for, you know, legal compliance. You know, I want to make sure that, you know, when something, ha you know, when something is accessed in my environment, I have a, you know, alarm or some sort of notification that, uh, um, you know, indicates that that's happened. I have some ability to capture and analyze all my logs. Um, and I can integrate that with a workflow that allows me to review alarms and, uh, you know, deal with them one by one. Some of the logs that you'll want to start collecting um, as soon as you can, uh, asset management logs. And when I say asset, this is you know, not only your physical you know, assets, you know, individual workstations that you're issuing to people, uh, but also your you know, uh, cloud assets, your resources in AWS, your EC2 instances, your, data, your RDS database instances, your DynamoDB tables, your Lambda functions. You know, all of these are you know, assets in your environment that you want to make sure that you have you know, you know, historical visibility into. You know, what EC2 instance was running at a given time? Um, you, want, you want to make sure that this is all in your log system in sort of a machine-readable, structured way, um, in a way that's not dependent on an instance-based agent. You want to be getting this information from AWS, from the control plane, rather than relying on you know, security software that's running on each one of these instances to self-report that, hey, I'm here. Um, you want to take advantage of uh, API-driven log analysis, um, you know, pull you know, all the logs from your various sources, whether that's AWS, whether that's your individual applications and tasks, um, CloudTrail is going to provide that, that from an AWS control plane level. Uh, and then CloudWatch logs or Elasticsearch, um, you know, Logstash, Kibana, that stack is you know, useful for pulling in you know, arbitrary logs or logs from your individual applications. Um, you, know, you can also analyze these logs using, um, you know, for some things, the built-in AWS CloudTrail console. Um, you can use Kibana in combination with Elasticsearch in order to analyze them. Um, you can use Amazon Athena for uh, you know, performing MapReduce type jobs on them. Um, it's, there's a lot of different flexibility, depends on the tool set and your investigation needs. Um, you also want to, you know, you don't just want to collect all those logs. It's, you know, mandatory to collect them. You want to collect them, you know, as, you know, as soon as you can. Um, you know, this is one of the, you know, first things that you're going to have to remediate if you have an incident and you don't have logs, is start pulling in everything you can. Um, but you also want to make sure that you're, you know, using those logs, that those logs, you know, can provide actionable, actionable um, you know, information and notifications that you can, uh, uh, you know, sort of receive, queue, act on. Um, CloudWatch events is a really simple way to do this in the AWS console, uh, or in AWS, rather. It allows you to, you know, set certain, um, 
you know, query criteria. We you know when I see an API call from you know, this service come in and do something like this, I want to raise an event, and then I want to you know, receive it. Maybe I want it to trigger a Lambda function that opens a ticket on my ticketing system. Maybe I want it to you know, publish to an SNS topic I have you know, attached to my you know, on-call pager. Um, you know, whatever I, I need to do, um, I think a ticketing queuing workflow is the best. Um, but this allows you to um, you know, get notifications of really key actions, particularly things like you know, creating or removing IAM principles. You know, that's not something that's going to be happening all the time in production. And it is something that, if it occurs in your production account, should really only be associated with a planned change. So things that represent you know, you know, sort of dangerous or um, you know, substantial mutations to your production environment are the things you want to alert on so that you can you know, uh, you know, be aware of those changes. Um, AWS config is another tool. This is going to give you an inventory of your resources. So if I have, you know, you know, uh, VPC with various, you know, subnets and configurations with, uh, you know, EC2 instances, you know, I want to be able to go back and look at the overall structure in my environment. What were the instance IDs, particularly what were the IP addresses were in use, um, and, uh, you know, push that into my log index so I can analyze based on that. Um, AWS config delivers that as a, you know, a JSON file, a configuration snapshot when things in your environment changes, change. Um, but you can also create config rules. Um, a config rule is you know, either a built-in or a user-defined function that you know, takes that snapshot in, you know, you know, performs some additional inspection on the environment, and tells in you know, returns whether or not your environment are, is in or out of compliance. So this can be a really easy way to you know, enforce a rule like all these EBS volumes must be encrypted in my environment. You know, I create a config rule that says, you know, you know, enumerate all the EBS volumes in my snapshot, you know, check to see if the encryption flag is set. You know, if it is, then my environment is in compliance. If it's not, my environment is out of compliance. So particularly if you're managing multiple accounts or if you have a um, regulatory requirement, that's going to give you the sort of the continuous monitoring that you uh, would need there. Uh, Amazon Inspector is an agent-based solution. Uh, this is for managing or for inspecting the running software on a you know, EC2 instance to, uh, for common vulnerabilities. Um, you know, this is output that you know you can then you know log and retain yourself. You know, I ran an inspect. You know, I ran a uh, you know inspector run on my EC2 instances, and I you know said that there were no vul vulnerabilities reported. You know, on Monday, uh, you know things like that. And then Amazon Guard Duty is a managed service for you know pulling in you know logs from your environment, things like CloudTrail, things like VPC flow logs. You know, your DNS logs. Um, you know, matches them against threat intelligence that you know. You know, we maintain internally as well as purchase from third-party partners in order to create a list of findings in your environment. You know, you know this traffic looks a little bit suspicious, or you know this traffic is, is heading toward a, a known suspicious IP. Um, you know, you can then you know push those alerts into your you know ticketing or incident management system, you know, and review and dismiss them as necessary. Uh, change management is really big. I've uh, talked a little bit about you know wanting to you know raise events and uh, and handle that when you know certain things occur outside of a you know planned change, and you know that's um, you know, a really key concept when you're talking about a production environment. You want to separate out your development and production environments such that you know when you're logging and you know bringing about all these things that are happening in your production environment. Um, you know, they're actually substantial. If you're intermingling development and production, it can be very difficult to figure out, you know, whether or not something is actually a threat or someone just messing around trying to, you know, figure out how to do their job, right? Um, so in a production environment, you really want, you know, clear controls over how you do change management. Uh, you know, that starts with infrastructure as code, things like cloud formation, you know, things like automating your instance and image builds, uh, automating your deployments, um, so that you know when changes are occurring, you can link them back to, plan to you know, things that you planned. Um, you know, from there, uh, AWS config, you know, config rules, CloudWatch, CloudWatch events, these are all parts of a solution for, you know, change management and monitoring. And just, just some URLs and resources here. So you want to apply security at all layers. Um, you know, what does that mean? So you know, in security, we like to use the concept of defense in depth. You know, securing your systems can be considered you know, layer by layer, and you use these layers to protect your most valuable assets, your data. So out here on the you know, outer, outer rim, you know, AWS looks after the physical security of our facilities and, your host, and the host security of you know, the hypervisors. 
you know, in, under the shared responsibility model, you know, you're taking responsibility for the, you know, software and operating system running on your EC2 instances. You know, we're not, you know, inside there. We're not looking at, at what's going on. You know, we can't. Um, you know, but we're responsible for the isolation of the hypervisor, or the security of the facilities, um, and the security of the virtual networking between them. Um, and then on you know, your end also is to properly configure your environment for your workload. So this means you know, configuring your VPC with the network boundaries that are appropriate for your you know, compliance and workload. You know, the security groups, network ACLs, subnets, route tables, gateways. Uh, again, you want to manage this as infrastructure as code and CloudFormation. Um, and you want to you know, break this down into what makes sense for your application. You know, I might have a public facing load balancer for an external application you know, that's you know, only could talk to my backend instances for you know, that app, which can only talk to the database, you know, and all the way in reverse up the stack. Uh, sorry, I'm short on time. I'll have to do, yeah. Um, and uh, you know, depending on you know, whether or not you're accessing the application internally or externally, you're going to have a different you know, network, uh, network service for those. Um, it also applies to system security. So again, you know, we take responsibility for you know, the, the hypervisor and below, so to speak, in EC2. Um, you know, but the system security is up to you. So this you know, goes down to your choice of operating system, you know, Linux, Windows, distribution of your choice, um, patch management. You know, how am I ensuring that I'm always running the, you know, most, you know, the latest version of my operating system with the, you know, the latest operating system patches? You know, you know, I have a choice of different upstream Linux distributions. I can you know, manage them using their own tools, or I can manage them using AWS Systems Manager, which allows which is an agent that runs on the machine, you know, reports current patching status, and then tells me what, uh, you know, what remediation actions I may need to apply. And then data, you know, all the way down past your, you know, past to, you know, the physical infrastructure, past the logical infrastructure, and onto the actual application data that you're handling. You know, certain things like encryption at rest can be you know, handled or maybe encryption at transit at the load balancer level can be handled at a higher level. You know, but a lot of times, particularly with more sensitive workloads, you're going to need to you know, push your security controls and data encryption into your application. You know, so this you know, you know, raises questions of how are users authenticating to my application? You know, are they doing so securely? Am I using you know, a, you know, identity as a service provider that maybe handles some of that work for me? Am I, um, or all the libraries that my application use, you know, up to date. You know, like it's you know great if I'm using something external for authentication, but maybe if there's an exploit in my JWT library, then you know my application is not so secure anymore. So, you know, making sure that you know the, the application's dependencies are are up to date, uh, making sure that you know your, my application is correctly implementing access controls. You know, particularly for a multi-tenant SaaS application, is important. Want to make sure I have good test coverage there, um, and good access logging, um, and then encryption. You know, it's just because you know, I have a, you know, putting all my data in a database, you know, that's a very wide surface area for potentially a malicious database administrator. You know, maybe a database administrator, I just don't want to see all of my you know, sensitive customer data. So that can go down to things like you know, using KMS within your application to encrypt individual fields. So maybe you know, most, you know, most of the fields I need to query by are you know, stored in the clear, whereas you know, fields that represent sensitive data, you know, you know, specific data that you know, operators shouldn't be able to access is encrypted, so that that only gets pulled out by only gets pulled back when users are using the application. So let's look at three ways of handling infrastructure protection in AWS. Uh, obviously, network and host level boundaries, you know, system security, config and management, and then service level protection. You know, VPC and subnet designs, um, you know, big things, you know, use subnets to separate, you know, first you have to use them to separate availability zones. You know, consider using them to separate workloads, particularly if you're operating multiple workloads in the same account at you know, vastly different security levels. Um, you can use network ACLs to prevent access between subnets, and then route tables to deny or allow internet access or access to other, um, you know, other network areas um, you know, from those you know, individual subnets. And then security groups you know, are um, you know, attached rather than being attached at the subnet level or attached at the network interface level. So you can use those to you know, logically reference each other so that I may have a pool of application servers spread across three subnets. You know, I want them to be able to talk to a pool of another app, you know, you know, servers for another application. You know, and rather than having to carve them all up into different subnets and use you know, CIDR blocks as firewall rules, I can logically refer to them using security groups. Uh, you know, security groups are, you know, if you you know, have sort of simple operations. You know, security groups and network ACLs are, you know, both, um, you know, ways to control traffic in your environment. A lot of times we see customers, you know, choose to use both if they have separation of control. 
So for example, they might have a networking team that's responsible for the you know, you know, overall you know, architecture of the networks and the flows between them. And then you know, within you know, a particular segment of that, application teams might control traffic within you know, the tiers of their application. And so in those cases, it's useful to use both NACLs and security groups. Um, limit what you run in public subnets, obviously. You know, no reason to throw everything out there. Um, you know, obviously, your elastic load balancers for or application load balancers for your um, you know, public endpoints. Um, you know, any bastion hosts that you need to get to. Um, you know, again, try and avoid where possible having a system directly accessible for, from the internet. You know, you want to break that down just to the, your bastion hosts and load balancers. And then, you know, external connectivity for management. Um, you know, for, you know, simple connectivity to another network, you know, whether that's, you know, you know your office or on-premises, you can use a VPN gateway, or if you're, you're talking about a much larger, you know, higher throughput, um, you know, uh, situation, you can use Direct Connect. Again, system security configuration and management. Uh, this is something that you'll want to consider on your own if you're using EC2. Um, you know, again, OS-based firewalls, this isn't something you necessarily need to do. Security groups do, are intended to allow you to, um, you know, <coughs> subsume that functionality without having to, you know, modify, you know, firewall rules and security groups. Um, it also, you know, prevents you from locking yourself out, um, you know, by, you know, trying to configure the firewall rules on an individual host. Um, you know, but in some, in some situations, you know, it may be necessary, um, particularly if you have very, very long rule sets. You know, maybe I have a host that's out, you know, extended to the internet. You know, I need, you know, tons and tons and tons of rules to, to whitelist um, or blacklist certain traffic. You know, that's something I may need to do, run on the instance because I'm going to be, you know, you know eating the, the cost of computing that myself rather than having to, rather than being able to push that off to a security group. Again, not something you're going to have to do, you know, particularly often, though. Um, CVE vulnerability scanners, things like AWS Inspector, you know, this allows you to maybe catch things that you didn't uh, otherwise see, although I wouldn't rely on them entirely. Um, you want to make sure that your application is being built from clean dependencies, clean up-to-date dependencies, and your operating system is, you know, being, you know, updated, uh, you know, from upstream. Uh, but CVE vulnerability scanners can help, like, catch stuff that falls through the cracks. Uh, virus scanners or other endpoint security software. Um, you know, that particularly uh, the you know, managed endpoint detection and response stuff is something you may need to consider if you're in a high-risk environment. You know, again, removing unnecessary tools from the operating system. You know, don't, don't pull in the world if you, if you don't need it. You know, start from a, a, you know, a, a thin image and build what you need to. Um, remove direct access to machines. You know, if you don't need you know, direct SSH access, you can use Systems Manager to run commands remotely on machines. Or in one case, I've seen customers use Systems Manager to, you know, automatically provision temporary user accounts rather than having permanent user accounts on all their machines. And then again, Amazon Inspector to scan your OS and application for uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, service level protection, um, you know, use IAM policies, you know, with least uh, lowest privilege levels. You know, use fine-grained controls within these policies. Um, I'm going to talk about this before. Let's talk about automation. Um, ensure best, pra best practices. So uh, our advice is to template everything. You know, nothing goes into production that has not been template templated uh, is a good rule of thumb. You know, have a development sandbox, you know, twiddle in the console all you want in your development sandbox, you know, try stuff out, make sure it works. But before you promote stuff to production, make sure that you can automate it and it's templated. Uh, when you make changes to it, modify the template and then apply it using a change set. Um, you know, CloudFormation is our built-in solution for this. Uh, we have, there's also third-party solutions like Terraform. Uh, really, really, really key to do this as early as possible. It's much harder to retrofit an environment if you've, you know, sort of built it up from, um, you know, as a pet. Uh, to go back and try to rebuild that from scratch. Um, utilize CI CD pipelines. You know, the, you know, these infrastructure templates are code, you know, just like your application. And so what you want to do is you want to make sure that, you know, if I change that template, you know, it gets, you know, validated, it gets deployed into maybe a staging environment where I see if it works or not. And then, you know, then and only, you know, then if it's approved, I validate in staging, I promote that change to production. Um, you know, custom AWS config rules. You know, how do I, you know, you know, how do I, uh, you know, go into an account, make sure that it's in compliance with the, you know, policies we've set, you know, to comply with our requirements. You know, go in, you know, set up at config rules to, uh, you know, evaluate them. If I see, you know, big line of, you know, green dots, I know that, you know, my environment's in compliance. If I get an alarm that, you know, something's fallen out of compliance, I can ticket the responsible, you know, team or individual to, you know, remediate that. Um, 
and automate, and to the extent possible, automate the response to non-compliant infrastructure. You know, this can be, you know, an automated response just as a notification, you know, to get your, you know, individual team say that you've created, you know, something that's not secure, um, you know, please fix it. Um, you know, maybe someone creates an open S3 bucket. You know, there's, there's reasons to have an open S3 bucket, but there's not that many. So if you need, if, um, you know, someone creates that, you know, maybe you automate it to, you know, to ticket them, you know, please provide your exception to this policy before we, you know, go ahead and close off access to it. Things like that can, you know, really improve the security posture of your environment, even if you have a lot of different teams working in different AWS uh, accounts. Um, Designing for immutable, uh, immutable infrastructure. You know, if you design you know, from day one to you know, be able to build up your infrastructure and throw it away, your life will be a lot easier. Um, it's much easier to you know, build up smaller test and development environments. Um, it gives you, you know, certainty that you know, when you are applying changes automatically, it's going, they're going to work correctly. Um, you know, again, it ties into infrastructure as code. Um, it's much easier to recreate and update and deploy you know, versions of your environment, subsets of your environment. Um, and maybe this cloud formation allows you to, uh, to build and deploy this. Um, you know, again, part of infrastructure is code is security is code. Um, you know, not only, you know, take for, or take for an example on, you know, an AMI that you're running as a web server, you know, patching PHP on, you know, we've defined this as a cloud formation template and deploy this into our environment, you know, really simple application. Um, AWS inspector, you know, maybe I have a, you know, job running that runs an AWS inspector evaluation every day or every week. Um, you know, that's going to come back and say that, you know, the, you know, there's an exploit in the current version of Apache, and then that, you know, environment is automatically at risk. You know, we can trigger an automated event to patch the system. You know, maybe I, I can schedule a downtime window right there in Systems Manager. Um, and then from there, I can create a new hardened AMI, you know, snapshot that, and then roll that into my new environment using, you know, say, an auto-scaling group. Um, so the, the more you automate this, the more you design your environment to be you know, immutable and disposable, you know, the more confidence you can sort of up the level of automation in, that env in your environment. And being able to up the level of automation in your environment is really the key to you know, being able to make it secure. Where environments tend to fall out of you know, compliance, where they tend to you know, you know, start uh, um, harboring vulnerabilities, old software, things like that, is when you're afraid to make changes to your infrastructure because you know, it's manually set up, you know, we don't make changes often, you know, we have to test, you know, we, it's you know, labor intensive to make these changes, and if you sort of get there, it's like a, a downward spiral you know, of um, you know, your overall security posture. So again, automating from day one, uh, infrastructure as code from day one, all of this stuff you know, is you know, not only going to you know, help you um, you meet your security requirements, but also just you know, allow you to have a more agile environment you know, in general. And that's really the benefit you're, you're trying to get out of cloud. Uh, again, URLs and resources here, you know, these, these will be all online. Yes, yeah. Um, you protecting data in transit at rest. Um, so where I like to start with this is classifying your data based on sensitivity. Um, you want to you know, sort of carve up, you know, what sort of data are my applications handling, right? You know, if I'm, you know, maintaining a uh, you know, public website with, um, you know, restaurant reviews and, you know, all my users are anonymous and everything, there's, you know, there's not a lot of really sensitive data there. But if I'm, you know, building an application for education or if I'm building up, you know, an application for you know, individuals to store their personal notes, you know, I, I you know, start needing to pick up uh, I, I start having different levels of data sensitivity, and I start needing to figure out how am I going to handle these, you know, throughout my organization. Um, you know, the you know, very simplest way you can do this is, you know, I have public data. You know, this is unencrypted. This is non-sensitive. This is available to everyone. You know, this is our marketing site. Um, and then I have cr critical data. You know, this is users that, or this is data that my users gave me. You know, I, they're, tr you know, expecting me to, you know, keep this data safe. Um, you want to make sure that data is encrypted. You want to make sure that data is not directly accessible from the internet. You know, that includes things like making sure that PDFs I generate for these users are not just sitting around in a public S3 bucket. Um, you know, that when, you know, I, uh, that when users request data that, uh, um, or request documents, request, uh, um, you know, make request my application that could, you know, could pull back uh, you know, critical data that you know, authorization and authentication checks are being performed. Um, so one way to do this is to, 
Um, you know, again, when you're looking at your environment as a whole, um, use resource tags at the AWS resource level, instances, buckets, et cetera, um, to you know, define you know, what the overall security policies you know, for this uh, um, your resource is. You know, is this a critical bucket or is this a you know, public bucket? And you, you, obviously, you can tie that into your IAM policies. You know, this, this policy is allowed to read from you know, public buckets. This policy is not allowed to read from you know, critical, um, you know, critical uh, buckets or resources. Um, and this also allows you to you know, tailor your config rules. You know, if I have a bucket that's classified at a certain level, you know, I you know, want to make sure that's you know, enforcing encryption. You know, if it's classified at a different level, you know, maybe I don't care as much. Um, this is all useful information if you're starting from day one. Uh, this is perhaps less useful if you already have you know, hundreds of S3 buckets with data that you've collected over the last you know, five to 10 years of operating in AWS. Um, you know, this is a, a you know, problem that you know, a lot of customers officially face. And this is where some ser a service like Amazon Macy might come in. Um, you know, particularly with new compliance requirements coming, you know, customers need to evaluate their environment. You know, does this bucket contain what I think it does? Or does it have you know, backups in it from you know, eight quarters ago that you know, may have had PII in them? You know? So what Amazon Macy does is it actually pulls in data from your S3 buckets, you know, checks it against a machine learning model to see, you know, is this bucket likely to contain PII or other sensitive information? So that, that allows you to sort of retroactively go through and start cleaning up, classifying your environment. Uh, encryption, uh, you want to encrypt in transit and at rest. Um, uh, thankfully, it's, it's now no longer really acceptable to be running uh, on a you know, plain vanilla HTTP anymore. You know, most everyone has moved to TLS. Um, so you know, obviously TLS uh, you know, for uh, you know, all connections between you know, external users and your you know, uh, public endpoints, your APIs, your websites, et cetera. Uh, you may also consider, based on your requirements, you know, the use of TLS within your environment. Things like uh, connecting to your database hosts, <coughs> and making internal API calls, you know, making sure that um, you, know, you have you know, full encryption throughout the stack, both in transit and at rest. Um, AWS endpoints themselves are HTTPS. Um, you know, when you're making calls to AWS, AWS APIs, those are encrypted. Um, but other things, if you have VPC to VPC connectivity, or, or sorry, VPC to another network connectivity, um, you, you obviously want to set up a VPN of some sort. If you're using some sort of VPN uh, endpoint as a, or VPN terminator as a um, you know, bastion host for access into your environment, you know, it's common to set up something like OpenVPN so that you know, your operators can you know, access hosts in AWS directly. You know, that's a, a layer of encryption between your VPC and your know, end users. Um, and then Elastic Load Balancer and CloudFront, you know, those will manage TLS uh, termination for you as well. Uh, data at rest, um, you know, this is, it's important to note, well, you know, sort of what the purpose of what data, you know, encryption of data at rest serves. You know, this, is, this means that the data that is actually physically stored on disk, you know, those individual blocks are not plain text. You know, if I have, you know, personal data, customer data, if someone you know, yanks a hard drive out of it and you know, dumps that, am I going to see blocks that contain customer data or not? Um, so uh, data at rest encryption is uh, managed in AWS through a uh, key management service and uh, you know, the services like EBS, S3, and RDS. Um, you, know, you go through and define you know, whether or not you want this to be you know, you know, just encrypted using the default key, or if I have maybe different workloads, I can you know, create individual custom KMS keys you know, that are used to uh, um, you know, encrypt the, encrypt, or, uh, you know, wrap the encryption keys used by each of these services. Um, you know, EBS and RBS snapshots, when you take a snapshot of an encrypted volume, the snapshot itself is encrypted. <coughs> uh, with KMS, you can also, you know, if I have a requirement to do this, you know, generate my own key material, say on my own HSM, upload that to KMS, and then if I want to revoke KMS's ability to use that, you know, use that key material I can at any point. You know, this allows you to sort of, you know, have a kill switch on the, you know, the key, you know, I've, key I've created. Um, and you can also, if you're, if you need, um, if you don't want, you know, any encryption to be happening server side at all, I can also encrypt data locally before uploading something like S3. Uh, again, this is all based on our key management service. Uh, encryption tokenization. Uh, tokenization is a, um, you know, it's. Um, a, a uh, technique used, I, I've you know, seen it a lot, and it's used obviously in payments, uh, and also I've seen it a lot in you know, healthcare research, where you know, I have a piece of data, I don't necessarily need to you know, access the underlying piece, 
um, I just need a, a handle that represents that somewhere this underlying piece exists. So this would be like a credit card number, you know, no individual identifying information. You know, so I provide that to a service that's then, you know, holding that securely, and then I only have sort of a token or an ID number that represents that, that or represents this piece of information. So if I, you know, this is common in uh, payment workflows. You know, I submit my credit card number to a website. You know, that website or a, or a uh, software development um, you know, tool or software development kit that their payment provider has takes that information, encrypts it, and, you know, takes it away on their platform, and then you, you as the application owner left with simply like an ID number that represents that. You know, so if your database gets dumped to the world, um, you know, they don't have any information that can actually be used to make a credit card transaction. Um, again, I've seen this used also for, for PII. Um, if you're, uh, you also, if you need to, uh, you know, integrate with a, uh, a fully PKCS uh, 11 compliant hardware security module, you know, this might be necessary for, um, you know, doing things like, um, you know, managing, you know, root, uh, you know, root or intermediate certificate authorities, you know, integration with, uh, you know, certain banking providers. Uh, we also have, um, you know, Cloud HSM, which is a, a fully, you know, user controlled hardware security module, FIPS, you know, FIPS validated. You know, we in no way control the, you know, keys or the device. You know, we have no access into the, um, you know, the uh, um, secure user portion of the device. And so this allows you to, you know, implement those sort of workloads in AWS. So let's talk about how to prepare for security events. Um, and this is, you know, incident response. You know, this is a, um, you know, a win not if situation for any, uh, you know, you know, for any application that's going to be, you know, uh, used at all, right? You know, even in, even if you have a mature preventive and detective solution in place, you need to consider, you know, not just consider, you need to create a mitigation plan. You know, what happens, you know, if, you know, these keys get leaked, or what happens if this control fails and this happens? You know, it's it's common to. You know, you know, run through temporary scenarios and you know, with your team and figure out, you know, what's the worst that could happen and, and how would we sort of go through that? How would we work the problem? Um, if you've tagged resource groups and data sensitivity and in, uh, in the detection of a breach, you can quickly see the impact. You know, if I know that you know a certain account or a certain zone represents you know a certain data classification or a certain subset of the data in my you know application or stack. Um, it's much easier to sort of contain and localize that. Whereas if I have a big AWS account full of everything, it's going to be much harder to figure out you know, what the scope of a breach is, you know, what sort of lateral movement may have occurred, et cetera. Um, so obviously, you know, additional tags, you know, such as the owner of a service or the, you know, individuals responsible is useful to help page in the right people for an incident. Um, you can also use the API to automatically, you know, remove a potentially breach system, you know, from a load balancer by changing the security group. You know, this can be useful for isolating an instance prior to forensics. Uh, and then Autoscale can then replace it with a clean host. And then CloudFormation can be used to quickly, you know, recreate a new trust environment. You know, if I know that, you know, my environment has been breached, you know, I can, you know, go through and if I can identify, um, you know, how to remediate that, I can then automatically go through, create a clean environment, you know, while I perform forensics on the old one. Um, resources, again, back to AWS Wall Architect at the security pillar. Um, you know, this is a good place to start. You know, it's a, um, you know, both a guide to overall principles as well as specific implementations in AWS, it can be helpful. Um, and with that, thank you. Um, this is not my email address.